All righty, folks. First show of the new year. Happy New Year, everybody. I hope everybody had a great holiday season. I know I did. I know I know we did because there was a, a humongous rule to read. Uh, and that means that everybody needs to craft their public comments. So we thought we would kick off the year uh, with an episode that we will refer back to probably many, many times throughout the rulemaking adventures of 2024 uh, by talking about how to craft good and constructive public comments. It was no surprise to us that um, in wake of the rule, you know, being exposed and, and being brought out into the public that um, there was a lot of conversation, right, that, that, that started taking place. And, and the common theme among all of those converse, conversations were, and I felt like I, I wish that I would have gone through LinkedIn and said, this would make for a great public comment. One of my LinkedIn posts that I put up, somebody said, I hope that this makes it into the comments because this is the type of stuff that needs to be commented on. And I think it's important that people understand exactly the process um, that is laid out and guidance that's actually being given to submit a comment that is meaningful and sound and, and that is going to make an impact on the rule. Yeah, and so I, I, I think that this is a great idea, setting aside one episode of the podcast just to provide guidance that people will reference back on. And like you said, we're definitely going to reference back on this because yeah, I think sure. a lot of conversation is going to be about this over the next couple months. Absolutely. So before we get started, just so everybody <clears throat> knows, on January 10th, 2024, depending on when you're listening to this, Summit 7 is having a webinar going through the entire rule, top to bottom comprehensive overview of what's going on. Uh, you know, we took a little bit of time after the rule was released because there's just a lot of information in the rule. Very tough to visualize and connect all the dots. The rule is large. It is very repetitive. Uh, there's a lot going on inside. So we're going to do that on January 10th. So consider this to be a good episode to reference uh, through your own reading, maybe some of the dots that we're able to connect in the webinar so that you can submit good public comments. Side note, the public comment period for NIST SP 800-171 revision three and 171A revision three is still open uh, at the time of this podcast. There will be a public comment uh, period on 172 and 172A. So even though that is not actually part of the what, what we would call the rulemaking process, the fundamentals for submitting constructive comments uh, should be uh, sort of universal evergreen advice. Uh, and this isn't just uh, our advice. This isn't just something that we took out of nowhere. If you go to the uh, CMMC proposed rule or to the um, Federal Register link where they have the CMMC guidance document and you click submit a comment, at the top, there's a little link. It's kind of hard to miss. And it'll say commenters checklist. And it takes you to a screen on regulations.gov, which is sort of the official repository of all of the rulemaking dockets and everything like that. And they've got this big checklist of things that you should consider when you're crafting your public comments. And that's what we're going to go through today. So we'll link to that. We'll link to the proposed rule. We'll link to the NIST comment period. We'll link to our webinar. We'll link to your posts. I had some posts on uh, LinkedIn about public comments. Plenty of things to read and to consider. So let's jump right into it. So this is the regulations.gov commenters checklist. Subtitle is tips for submitting effective comments. You know, quick note, the special edition of the Cyber AB Town Hall on Tuesday uh, saw, uh, you know, I was on there, I was on there with Bob Metzger, I was on there with Eric Crucius, and it came up again and again and again that submitting comments is a good thing, uh, but submitting constructive comments is what everyone should really be striving for. Uh, for many reasons. So we'll link to that AB Town Hall as well. So you can check. That hey, out. before you jump in, did you, uh, I'll be totally transparent. I did not know this existed. This commenters did, checklist? Yeah, didn't be, I was today years old when I found out. This <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I came across it whenever I was going through all the links on, you know, I've seen things like this, but I don't know if I've actually seen. I mean, regulations. when you look at the recommendations, completely makes sense. It's just, yeah. I, I did not know that this actual link existed until yeah. There's all kinds 30 of minutes fun. before we have on rulemaking here. is fun. There's all kinds yeah. of cool things that you find whenever you start digging around on the federal register and regulations.gov, you know, it's when uh, you're bored and you're like, what else can I do on this website that I haven't done for the past, I don't know, six find, and a half years. You get to find new things. You get to do your civic duty. 
here we go, everybody. Okay, so the overview of this document from regulations.gov says, a comment can express simple support or dissent for a regulatory action. Very important point. Um, a lot of comments that get submitted on rules criticize the rule. They argue against parts of the rule. They uh, do. They express various forms of dissent uh, against the rule. And I would just like to stress at the top, it is probably, it is as important, if not more important, for people who agree with the rule or with parts of the rule to express that they agree with some parts of the rule or the basis of the rule or whatever. Uh, you typically, this is not, this is, you know, this is, we're talking about rulemaking here. We're talking about policy making. This is going to create a regulation that will affect real people in real ways. This is not Yelp reviews, right? So online reviews tend to be quite negative because people only write reviews when they have a problem. And so the same trend can show up in public comments. So especially for the people who probably typically listen to this podcast, if you agree with the basis for the rule, if you like things that are in the rule, then you should express that in your public comments. Still be constructive Absolutely. if you have uh, points for improvement or recommendations for things that could be tweaked or changed. But make sure that you emphasize, yeah, I think this is great and it could be better this way. I think this is great. It doesn't need to change, so on and so forth. You don't just need to comment uh, if you disagree. And if for whatever reason you want to see the CMMC program you know, succeed and come to fruition, it's probably even more important that you express that idea. Otherwise, all the public comments will just be negative. However, Jacob, don't <laughs> comment just to comment, right? Yeah. And they clearly state that, right? Don't comment yeah. just to comment. Make sure that it's meaningful and there's justification behind it. And there's information, it's constructive and something can be done with it, right? Either, sure. yay, congratulations, you got this part right. Or, hey, can we fix this a little bit? And this is the reason why. Not just like, this sucks that you extended uh, right. requirements to CSPs or you know whatever it may be. Like, right. why? Why does it stink? Yeah, and they keep going on their overview here. They say, you know, a comment can express simple support or dissent. However, a comment, uh, sorry, a constructive information rich comment that clearly communicates and supports its claims is more likely to have an impact on regulatory decision making. A constructive information rich comment that clearly communicates and supports its claims. Just like we're we're back in debate school, you know, debate class in high school, everybody. Uh, and so then they finish up and they say, these tips are meant to help the public submit comments that have an impact and help agency policymakers improve federal regulations. So here's their summary list of the detailed recommendations that they have later on. And, and what do you know? There are, this is not a joke. We did not edit this list, folks. There are seven items on this list, seven <laughs> recommendations on how to submit good comments. We're actually, we're gonna make that the title and, uh, and people are gonna go, oh, they did it again. Mm -hmm. We did not edit this list. Okay, number one. Read and understand the regulatory document that you're commenting on. I feel like that's important. Pretty good, yeah. solid opening recommendation here. You need to read the thing you're commenting on, right? Read the rule. It takes a while. There's 60 days to submit your comments, which is, uh, it is a long time. It's also not a long time if you're trying to cram your reading in at the last minute. So their number one summary recommendation, read the rule that you are commenting on. Appropriately ranked, I, I, I think. I like, think that's a good you know, opening. Yeah, I think that's a good yeah. place to start. Okay, number two, feel free to reach out to the agency with questions. Some things that people overlook is there is contact information listed at the top of the rule that says for more information or questions, contact. I believe it's Patricia Toppings is listed for the CMMC proposed rule. But if you have questions, that's the person that you're supposed to email and or call. So that's their number two thing. Feel free to reach out if you have questions. They do make a note here and say, uh, you know, calling up Patricia Toppings and asking questions or giving her a piece of your mind is not actually submitting a comment. So you do still have to submit your comment. You can't just call Patricia and tell her she's doing a great job or that you're not a fan, right? So just keep that in mind. Okay, number three, be concise, be concise, but support your claims, right? Uh, you know, this is not a, uh, there's no minimum length uh, that you have to hit for your paper in school that you're submitting here. You want to be as concise and as straightforward as possible. You know, like Bob Metzger was saying on the AB Town Hall, uh, the, the DOD does not have unlimited resources to comb through public comments. And so being as concise and as efficient as possible helps them be as efficient as possible to respond to public comments in the final rule in the future. Okay, number four, 
base your justification on sound reasoning, scientific evidence, and or how you will be impacted, right? So actually base your, uh, your statements and your claims on reasoning that is sound, on actual evidence that you have, or on how you will actually be impacted, right? And so this is why it's very important for people who agree with the rule to be able to do those things as well. Everyone is impacted by the fact that cybersecurity requirements in the DIB are going unimplemented. So you can sort of, you know, there's a there's a basis for how you are impacted um, uh, that you can submit in your comment off the top, uh, whether you agree with specific details or specific courses of action in the rule or not. Everyone is impacted by the rule. Uh, people are impacted negatively by the rule. People are impacted negatively without the rule. So there are multiple sides to every story. Uh, don't just submit your comments if you are disagreeing, but base your justification on sound reasoning, they say. Okay, point number five here, address trade-offs and opposing views in your comments. So we're stepping up from an undergrad paper to a graduate school paper here, and we're complicating our thesis. That's always the marker of a better paper, right? So what are the trade-offs to your position? Do you agree with this point? And it could be improved here. The trade-offs... Exactly. Are, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch, especially when we're talking about rulemaking here, right? We're making decisions that are all going to have trade offs. So, for instance, we are specifying 800 171 Rev 2 in the rule. I agree that it should be Rev 2. I disagree that it should be Rev 2. I agree that it should be Rev 2. The trade off is we're not going to keep up with the threat like we would if we kept the floating revision language that we have in DFAR 7012. Or it could be I disagree with 800.171 Rev 2 being specified. We should use a floating revision number that changes as the revision is updated. That is harder to keep up with and it creates a larger impact. However, it better addresses the threat, it keeps up with what's going on. There's trade offs to both situations. So address those trade-offs in your comment, they say. Okay, almost done here. Number six, there is no minimum or maximum length for an effective comment. Uh, like they said before, be concise, be as concise as possible, but support your claims and address your trade-offs. Okay, number seven, last one, the comment process is not a vote. I really like that they included this here. So the comment process is not a vote. This is not a, uh, this is not a referendum on, on the rule itself, right? The comment process is not a vote. One well-supported comment is often more influential than a thousand form letters. So you'll see this sometimes where uh, rule, you know, rules that have more attention from other agencies, F FCC rules and things like that. John Oliver did an episode about rulemaking and people will sort of, industry groups sometimes will create form letters and they're like, fill out this form letter and submit it as your public comment onto the rule. You're not fooling anybody, right? This is not, we're not tallying up how many people agree or disagree with the rule. We are trying to put constructive feedback to change the rule or not, right? So the comment process is not a vote. So those are those seven points that they have as their uh, sort of summary recommendations. Curious on your thoughts, and then we'll cover maybe some of their detailed recommendations here to wrap up. Yeah. So it's essentially know what you're commenting on, right? Reach out if you don't fully understand it. And then when you make a claim, make sure that it's straight, succinct, and to the point, and it's defended. And don't just complain. Don't just say that this is bad. This is bad. This is the reason why. This is a way that it can be better, right? This is a suggestion for a way to be better. Open up that pathway for the thing that you think is going to improve it. The other part that makes this extremely important to follow is that they say that this is the way to do effective comments. Effective comments are going to play a large role in this. Because once this is set in stone, there's a whole rigmarole that has to go through again, right? For the us only way to, to undo this... it, once the rule is final, the only way to change it is more rulemaking, right? So <laughs> yeah, and it's like that old adage, like you know, you get to no, told no a hundred percent of the time that you don't try, right? So if there's a problem and there's something that is really irking you about the rule, follow the checklist, submit a very good comment that defends your support and supports your claim, yeah. and then cross your fingers and pray for the best, right? You don't have to lobby. You don't lobby anybody. They're going to read it and they're going to say, yeah, Jacob's got a point here. Let's dig into this. I don't this know if they're going to say that. I don't know if they're going to say that. <laughs> but anyways. But you uh, know, but like if you put it together well it. enough, yeah, like yeah. So, he does have so, a point, you know? Yeah, for for instance, um, you know, one of the tenets of the rule that we'll get into mm -hmm. in a future episode, I'm sure, is 
the uh, concept in the rule that managed service providers need to have an equivalent level certification as their clients. Highly contentious point in the rule. Uh, There's you just may so agree. many, so many veins that go down with that. Like, oh yeah, well, what yeah, about absolutely. this and what about that? Like, it's, yeah. don't submit a form letter. Can I submit a, a freaking thesis statement <laughs> on managed service provider? Because yeah, there is. A, yeah, I just I, I just went down this wormhole for the past thirty two days. Here you right, go. Right. Right. Well, okay, so you know, the idea that an MSP needs a certification at all uh, is something you may agree with, it's something you may not agree with, uh, something that came up on the AB Town Hall sort of off the top of my head as we were kind of kicking the idea back and forth is you might say something like, hey, MSPs are incredibly important in the ecosystem, and maybe instead of requiring a certification, we could incentivize the use of certified MSPs. So you are effectively uh, requiring certified MSPs, even if you're not mandating that the MSPs are themselves certified, right? So you could say, yeah, I agree with this concept, but maybe we could tweak it in this way. You still get the end goal. And yeah, there's trade-offs to having, you know, MSPs uh, recommended or required to be certified, but it's probably worth it in the end. Something along that line of reasoning would probably be what would pass as a constructive comment rather than being, uh, MSPs being certified is bad. Next, right? That's that's not yeah. like okay. It, you're not voting here, right? You have to actually have input that might affect the substance of the rule. Uh, changing something, removing something, you know, regard sort of regardless of whether you agree or disagree. When when we get to that episode, we're gonna love hate each other for <laughs> however long we're on the air. Because yeah. like, well, there's a bunch I, of uh, yeah. I, mean, I love a, a million stuff. of the points that were made about it last night. I love some of the stuff that you're saying about it. And then I'm like, but what about this? And what about this? Yeah. And it still doesn't solve this. But what? Once again, the trade offs. What is more beneficial? Right. Yeah. Sometimes you're gonna have to be like, what? It's not for the whole flock, but maybe 75. I don't know. It, yeah. Good question. It's gonna be a good conversation. Yeah. Jacob, in this reg, uh, checklist, right there. They give you the summary. We went over those seven things, but then they give you detailed recommendations. And it's actually a list of 13 things or 13 detailed specific recommendations um, for you to submit a, a, a comment. Yep. Do you want to go over those? Yeah, let's just go through them real fast. Like I said, we're going to link to these. You should definitely read them. And just like they said with their number one recommendation, you should read the rule. So mm -hmm. here you go. You should check these out. But here's just the rapid fire list. Okay, so the first thing they talk about in their detailed recommendations is a, uh, uh, a a pretty good piece of information. Comment periods close at 11.59 Eastern time, the day comments are due. So begin work well before the deadline. That means that comments for the CMMC proposed rule are, de are due at 11.59 Eastern on February 26th of 2024. So don't wait until 9 p.m. on February 26th to crack open the rule for the first time. Uh, uh, when that comment period is closed, there's no more comment submissions. So uh, they close at 1159 Eastern on the dot. And I don't think that starting at 1145 Eastern is going to be enough time for you to put a concise, well thought informed comment together that is yeah. going to well, be Well, you know, I mean, you might be able to get one of them in there, but there's a lot of stuff going on in the rule. And we've all been waiting a long time for the rule to come out. So, you know, take your time and put some put some comments together. And this is a little bit of an exception when we talk about the NIST comment periods because they do have a deadline for when comments are submitted. But like Victoria Pilateri has said, and yeah, they Ross constantly said, take them in. They'll yeah. take them on a rolling basis yeah. if you send it to them anyways, uh, which is very nice. Rulemaking does not work that way. So make sure you give NIST uh, you know, a fist bump for being cool about it. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> next time you see Ron, make sure you fist bump. Hey, thanks for taking that rolling comment period. My man. Yeah. You can you can imagine the chaos of actual rulemaking having just a rolling perpetual comment period. You never get anything done. All right. Number two, attempt to fully understand each issue. Yes, please. Please attempt to understand the issue that you are commenting on. If you have questions or do not understand a part of the regulatory document, you may ask for help from the agency contact listed in the document. Call Patricia. <laughs> Say hello. Wish her a happy new year. Uh, her comment, uh, her contact information is at the top of the rule. She's probably not a fan that we're talking about that, but hey, it's there. It's uh, and they're recommending that you use it if you need that resource. OK, number three, clearly identify issues within the regulatory action on which you are commenting. If you are commenting on a particular word, phrase or sentence, provide the page number, the column and paragraph citation from the Federal Register documents. You can. Uh, in the web version of the rule, 
you each paragraph has its own hyperlink. So if you hover over the paragraph, you can link directly to that single paragraph. Uh, if you're looking at the PDF version, you can just go with the page number. Uh, I always try to link to the paragraph uh, link itself. Uh, when mm -hmm. you click on the link, it'll actually scroll right to that point, uh, that paragraph, and it highlights it in green. Very, very convenient, very easy to say, I'm commenting on this specific part right here in this massive, gigantic document. Uh, so make yeah. sure that, yeah, make sure that you specify what you're talking about if you're commenting on something specific. Yeah, it just it just points back to no generalized comments. This 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 stinks because this the MSP requirement stinks. What MSP requirement? Or yeah. The ESP now it might or, be you know, you know it might be cathartic. It might be uh, therapeutic. It might be it might it might help everybody feel better to be like yes, I agree with the policy basis for this rule. No, I disagree with the policy basis for the rule. That's not really what the comments are going to have an effect on at this point because clearly the policy basis is valid enough for the rule to have been issued in the first place. So we're talking about adjusting and changing things in the substance of the rule. Uh, I will link to a LinkedIn post I made a little while ago uh, of the many books that I've read on rulemaking, all of which are great. There's one in particular that I would highly recommend. And there's a quote in that book that talks about how the ability to fundamentally change big, big parts of a rule once it's published is pretty small. But the ability to adjust things between the time a proposed rule and a final rule is published is much more feasible. So you gotta you gotta understand what is what we're doing here when we're talking about commenting on the rule. We're not commenting on whether the rule should be published or not. That's uh, that's that's already water under the the rulemaking bridge, if you will. Okay, a couple more to get through here. Uh, if a rule raises many issues, do not feel com do not feel obligated to comment on every one. Select the issues that concern and affect you the most and or you understand the best. I think this is great advice. There's there's legal procedural stuff that has to happen in a rule. I am not an expert on uh, the various acts and uh, executive orders and the specific legal procedural checks that have to happen uh, for the rule to be considered to have done those analyses properly. If you ever find a American Bar Association, they comment on every rule, right? And a lot of the comments that the American Bar Association submits are on the procedure of rulemaking, right? Did you follow the right steps in the rulemaking process? They often don't comment on what the rule is actually doing there uh, because that's not their expertise. That's not what they're worried about. So uh, I think this is good advice. I, I agree. I think that it's really, really important, even more so now that they publish the comments and the responses in there. I just don't want to put one of those comments up that's going to get put in the role where like people are like, oh, like, yeah, I don't want world star. Video, I don't yeah. want world star video recordings of my ro my role proposal. Answer, I don't know right? how many people go through and read the comments. I have gone back and done that because it adds a lot of context. It was, it was the best section comments. of the rule. It was however, great. however, you know, your public comments are public record. And so if somebody really wanted to, they can go on to regulations.gov. They can go to the docket. Uh, as of, I think, our, our conversation right now, there's like 17 public comments. You can see who submitted them. They don't redact the public comments the way NIST does, right? NIST takes all the contact and specific information out of the comments. They just aggregate them and then publish them as part of, uh, the rulemaking process, who submitted it uh, is part of the record. Okay. Uh, agencies often ask specific questions or raise issues in rulemaking proposals on subjects where they are actively looking for more information. You will see this a couple times throughout the rule where the DOD will say, we invite public comments on the following issue, or we invite comments on this issue. Uh, and so the regulation.gov checklist continues. While the agency still accepts comments on any part of a proposed regulation, please keep these questions and issues in mind when formulating your comment. So there are parts of the rule where DOD specifically says, do you want, you know, we would like you to comment on this particular issue. A lot of times I think it's sort of default that they talk about this in terms of small business impact. They're like, please give us more information. If I recall correctly, the 2016 rule uh, received comments that they had underestimated the number of small businesses that would be affected in the estimate of impact on small businesses. So in the final rule, they increased the number of companies that they estimated would be impacted. Thank you for your comments. Our estimates were too low. These are our new estimates. And, you know, off to the races we go. Things like that. Uh, okay, next tip here. 
Although agencies receive and appreciate all comments, constructive comments, either positive or negative, are most likely to have an influence. Um, so just reiterating what they talked about in their key takeaways, be as constructive as possible, whether you agree or disagree. I don't know if there's too much more that we got to uh, hammer into the ground on that one. You see the same theme over and over again. So, okay, uh, let's see. The next point here, if you disagree with a proposed action, suggest an alternative, including not regulating at all, and include an explanation and or analysis of how the alternative might meet the same objective or be more effective. This gets back to our example. If you uh, disagree with Rev2 being specified, what should we do? Right. Uh, we should specify Rev3. We should specify no revision at all. We should specify a different 853 baseline or something. Right. As you know, now the feasibility of those suggested alternatives is uh, debatable, <laughs> but just saying you shouldn't specify Rev2 doesn't really give them a lot to work with, uh, whether they have the ability to work with it or all uh, or not is a separate matter. But if you just say specifying Rev2 bad, and then you go to your next comment, they're like, okay, <laughs> yeah. what, what would you like us to do here? So uh, just keep that in mind. Try to be as, if, you're, if you agree, you say, yes, this is great. And here's how you could tweak it. No, this is bad. Here's what you should do instead. Stuff so like that. this, the checklist is, and if you look at it at the theme, it's polite. And, and I don't mean this in a rude way, but it's politely saying, don't waste our time. Uh, yeah, I guess that, yeah, that's a good way of putting it because you right. have to imagine like the, the, not only do they have to get a torrent of public comments, but they have to sort those public comments to see and what are the respond. common themes and then they have to respond and possibly take action Yeah, like yeah, inside the rule. So if everyone, this is a reason why NIST uses a comment matrix when they say, submit your public comments, they give you the spreadsheet that says, you know, here's the standard way of submitting a comment. Of course, they love their standards, right? This is an editorial comment. This is a technical comment. This is an observation. Uh, and it's on this line. You know, they have the line numbers on their whole document. We don't have a comment matrix here uh, for rulemaking, but the same idea still holds, right? Yeah, it's so, and I I don't want that to sound negative. Like, but in the town hall, all three of the panels, you, Eric, and and, and Bob. Um, all basically had the same theme that this is a sign that DOD is standing on business, right? Like standing on business and, and kind of part of that is be succinct, be straight to the point and, and don't waste our time. Let's get constructive stuff out of here. Let's get this thing done. Yeah. That is the theme that I see emitting from every single response, every single part of the rule. Um, is there stuff that needs to be changed? Yeah, we know that now. Let's collaboratively work together, right? Let us know what needs to happen. We've all been waiting happen. long enough, right? Uh, right? Where, you know, we were just talking about this uh, earlier. We t were talking about it on LinkedIn. The, you know, the the time for verifying implementation of controls is a long past due, right? Yeah. We are years and years and years into the process of just, you know, dithering around about what to do here and we don't want to have any extra time added to the process with comments that are not useful and constructive. Just be constructive. You can disagree, but be constructive in your disagreement, right? Okay. Uh, their next point here to reiterate one of their summary points above, the comment process is not a vote. I love this point. The government is attempting to formulate the best policy. So in crafting a comment, it is important that you adequately explain the reasoning behind your position. It isn't just a thousand people said we don't like it and five people said we do like it. Uh, and therefore, the, the vote goes to the nays, right? This is uh, what specifically would you change in this policy that would still achieve the same policy goal, right? This is one of the reasons why at the top of the rule, they say, here's the legal justification and basis for the rule to begin with. And here is our proposed, it's the reason it's called a proposed rule, our proposed policy. What do you think, right? Just as a as a very high level observation to get to 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 get philosophical on everybody really fast, uh, rulemaking is essentially and being able to comment in rulemaking is essentially the closest experience that we have to participating in democracy, right? Uh, when the when the text of a bill is proposed in Congress, you don't get to go into a committee session and like 
mark up the NDAA with your red lines, right? Like you don't get to change it. You can call your representative, but you know, it's several steps removed here. You have what is essentially going to have the weight of a law in, in the form of a regulation. And you are submitting a comment directly to the people who are writing it and changing it, right? Like the people being affected by the law, if you will, are directly conversing with the people who are creating it. It's about as close as you can get to the concept of a democracy. The public comment period and the rulemaking process are extremely important civically, which is why we always say that people should participate. Okay, uh, identify credentials and experience that may distinguish your comments from others. If you are commenting in an area in which you have relevant personal or professional experience, for example, scientist, attorney, fisherman, businessman, uh, then say so, right? Uh, you should say, hey, I have expertise in this area and this is what I see, this is my reasoning, this is you know, why I know what I'm talking about. So if you are a cybersecurity professional and you've got experience and you understand what's happening, you have seen what's going on in the DIB in terms of security controls not being implemented, you have firsthand experience with the reasons why the rule is being issued in the first place, you should say so. You should say so. Uh, it's not just that I watched a podcast and I, I wanted to submit a comment, although that's fine too. It's not just that I watched John Oliver's episode on rulemaking and so I'm submitting a form letter. It's I have experience that informs my opinion. This is what I think you should do. And here's my comment, right? Uh, so I think this is really good advice. Uh, don't let your imposter syndrome, speaking to the cybersecurity people out there right now, it's a huge problem in our community. Don't let your imposter syndrome make you think that your comment uh, is not worth their time, right? Uh, your experience and your personal perspective informed by your experience and expertise is what helps make comments very constructive. So do not succumb to your imposter syndrome. New year, new you, submit your comments. Yeah, I think that uh, this is pretty important um, for the reasons that you stated, but the other reason is that, um, unfortunately, uh, even though they would like to have it this way, the team that wrote this rule, the people that are responsible for writing this rule, don't all have that expertise and those perspectives when they're going into this. So yeah. from one perspective, a part of this rule may sound excellent, right? From that business perspective. But then when you look at it from the technical or the cyber side, you're like, eh, not a good, good idea, right? Yeah. And so to offer differing perspectives to come into a mixing bowl, to come to a common uh, resolution is obviously what the goal of this whole thing is. I can is. already and tell. I can already tell in the text of the proposed rule that conversations around the rule leading up to its publication have influenced the contents of the rule in two specific ways. One, they specifically mention the concept of external service providers in a way that is broader than just cloud service providers, right? The idea, mm -hmm. even in their cost estimates for small businesses, they talk about businesses are utilizing managed service providers to facilitate these requirements. That is something that they have never mentioned before in 10 years of rulemaking, despite that being a real and relevant part of the supply chain. It is because people have brought this up to them over the years, consistently and repeatedly based off of our experience that they know that this is an element that they need to incorporate in the rule. Did they get it exactly right? Maybe, maybe not. That's what the public comments are for, but MSPs are included in the uh, the the eye of Sauron of the CMMC rule here, if you will, because people have brought it up. Uh, it isn't just the MSP part that is also relevant. Uh, they go to uh, you know spend more time specifying that 800.171a is how you verify the controls in 800.171, and that 800.172a is how you verify the controls in 800.172. That's always been the way that it works, but it wasn't as explicit as it could be. And so now they have made it more explicit. I don't think that that is a coincidence, right? It is because of people saying, hey, people don't know what 171A is. You need to be more explicit or, hey, this MSP thing is a real problem that is a knowledge gap for you guys. You should really think about what you're going to do there. Uh, same idea. So yeah, uh, and it's just not the and now, you know, with that expansion of the scope, you know, so to say, um, into the external service providers, it's not just the same people that have been beating the drum. Now it's a whole new crowd that's like, wait, what? Like yeah. caught in the crossfire, like, hold on. Like, yeah, why? well, and this is this is probably a show for another day, but uh, you know, it looping in managed service providers, uh, because they have always been a critical element of uh you know, implementing cybersecurity requirements in the dib 
and then having most managed service providers be like, what are you talking about? Yeah, dude. Is, is a very strong indicator that they got it right, that they should be looking closer at what's going on with the MSPs. When the, when, when, when the rule knocks on the MSP's door and they're like, what are you, what, what are you talking dude, about? Yeah. Dude, that's, we, that's we go to, <laughs> we go to plenty of conferences, right? And when I read that part of the rule and when we kind of got the hunch of, you know, when the leak came out that this was going to happen, the, I, I automatically like envisioned back to going to an MSP centric conference, right? And trying to talk to people about CMMC and they look at you like, Where's your handler? Like, who's yeah. responsible for this person Listen, here? There's like, a lot of great people in the MSP community. We've got a lot of yeah. close friends and partners in the MSP community. I love a lot of people. I will say, though, uh, I've been to MSP conferences in the past and been there to talk about CMMC. We're not there selling stuff. We're competing against these people, right? And I was just there trying to let people know what the situation is on the ground. And I've been laughed at. I've been scoffed at. I I've have been, been laughed at. Made yeah. fun of to my face. And like CMMC, what are you talking about CMMC for? Idiot. Like yeah. horrible stuff. And I'm like, listen, <laughs> I'm just letting you know it's coming around the corner. Anyways, that's another that's another episode of <laughs> another conversation. Let's finish up the list here and get out of here so everybody can write their comments. Okay. Number 10 on this list of their detailed recommendations. Agency reviewers look for sound science and reasoning in the comments they receive. When possible, support your comment with substantive data, substantive data, facts, and or expert opinions. You may also provide personal experience in your comment as may be appropriate. By supporting your arguments well, you are more likely to influence agency decision making. This is this is debate team 101. You make a claim, you support the claim, right? You can support your claim in many ways, but don't just make claims. This is typically the part that's missing from most LinkedIn discussions, right? Where people will comment, well-intentioned comments. I'm not, I'm not criticizing their sincerity here, but typically what happens is people will go, uh, CMMC good, CMMC bad, uh, prices will go up, uh, you know, innovation will be harmed, right? Those are claims. The part that's missing is the part that comes after the word because, right? So quick mm -hmm. Quick lightning round debate lesson here. If you say CMMC bad because innovation will be harmed because, right? Because such and such and such and such and such, right? The rest of the argument is what supports the claim. Just stating the claim does not make it true. So if your comments that you review before submitting are just a series of claims, as this checklist would tell you, go back and support those claims with some form of evidence, expert opinion, so on and so forth. Uh, don't just make claims because there's nothing you can do. It's, it's not very convincing to just say that something is true. You have to explain why it's true and ideally what to do as a result. Yeah, un make undeniable claims, right? Answer all the questions, all the what ifs when you put something up there and back it up with evidence. Have receipts, whatever you slang you wanna use, right? Come with receipts and let them know that this is bad. This is the reason that this is bad. Here's the trade-off, right? It's right. the common theme throughout this. Straight to the point, okay, it's a problem. Is there a solution? What's the solution? Tell me about it. Right? I'll give you another, you know, another quick example. People, one of the most common arguments is people will say, uh, CMMC is bad because it harms innovation. And then you're like, does it? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that it doesn't harm innovation. You know, maybe it does harm innovation, but the trade-off is worth it. But just simply saying it's harmful to innovation isn't a complete argument, right? It harms innovation. How much? How do you yeah. know? How do Are we there verify? statistics to back it up? How Whoa, do we verify is, that yeah. the claim is true? And you're like, it harms innovation because I read a New York Times article. And you're like, oh, okay. I mean, thank you for your input. But like, is do we know that? Do we know that for sure? I'm sure that there are many people out there who do know what the actual answer is. They should submit that in their comments. Simply submitting the claim uh, sort of does a disservice to your expertise and your experience. Support your claims. Support your claims, everybody. Okay. Uh, consider including examples of how the proposed rule would impact you negatively or positively. This is sort Again. of very similar to the previous point. Give examples. All right. Last two here. Comments on the economic effects of rules that include quantitative and qualitative data are especially helpful. Exactly the point that you just made. And then the last point that they have here, include the pros and cons and trade-offs of your position and explain them. Your position could consider other points of view and respond to them with facts and sound reasoning. 
just to sort of wrap up the summary points that they made at the top, there are always trade-offs. Thomas Sowell has a famous quote. He's an economist. He said, there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs, right? There basically is no way to thread the needle here where there aren't going to be trade-offs in some form or fashion. By its very nature, a regulation creates a barrier to entry, right? So simply saying CMMC creates a barrier to entry is a given, right? What do we get as a result of creating a barrier to entry? What price do we all have to pay for creating a barrier to entry? Is it worth it? You'll notice that in the rule, three quarters of the rule aren't the text of the proposed regulation. It's all of the reasoning and rationale that the agency has for why they're doing the rule. If you simply say, uh, you know, simply submit an unsubstantiated claim, it's not going to be enough to adjust their rationale or adjust the text of the rule. So there's many ways to approach it. There's many sides to every story. If you're going to make claims and participate in rulemaking, which you should, uh, make sure that your public comments are constructive by supporting those claims with evidence. Yeah. Um, again, don't waste our time, right? <laughs> like, like I, I listen. I know that it's a very, very harsh way of putting it, right? A, a very harsh string of words, but that well, is maybe maybe when I'm put, reading this. Let's put it this way: uh, Don't waste your own should, time, too, right? Well, you know? Don't waste your own time, and mm -hmm. if we all submit a big mess of. Uh, you know, lengthy, it won't be comments, happen. it yeah. will take longer for them to issue the final rule. And what's everybody going to say three months after the public comment period? Gee, rulemaking sure does take a while. What's taking so long? <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, the, the office inside the Pentagon has like a mountain of comments. They all have to sort through them. It, I can't even imagine how much work it is to actually have to sift. Through. Having read many of the comments, I do not envy the teams that go through rulemaking that have to actually consolidate and organize uh, those comments by theme and then respond to them well. So, you know, the better everyone's comments are, the faster this process will move and the less we will have to lament and speculate what could possibly happen in the future. What do you think that they, is, they like more? Do they like responding to the comments in the comment period or like crafting the role and putting the role together? Like, you know uh, what I mean? Like, <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't, I would, we would, we need to ask them. Well, you have to pick one. We, we can't we default to, and say neither. Like, we need to ask them, I think, uh, during the rulemaking process and years after the rulemaking process, because I have not heard anyone who is actually inside the rulemaking process for this rule or any other uh, express any level of enjoyment. <laughs> I think it's one of those things where it's like, it's very satisfying to have participated in something that, uh, in, to, in the machinery of government, if you will, uh, but mm -hmm. in it is an absolute grind. Uh, John Ellis, uh, who is now retired, former director of DCMA's DIBCAC team, <laughs> would regularly use very colorful language to describe uh, how important rulemaking is, but how much he did not enjoy, how much work and red tape. And I mean, it is it is an intense process. It is not a uh, it's not a trivial uh, thing that we're that we're going through here. Anyways, your public comments are important. This is what we've all been waiting for. Uh, so we're going to link to this list. We're going to link to the rule. We're going to link to the NIST uh, public comments as well, because these tips will uh, count over there. Uh, and, and ultimately, your comments on what happens with the NIST uh, requirements will be echoed in your CMMC assessments. So those are possibly even more impactful in the long run than just simply commenting on, you know, a typo in the rule here. So things to keep in mind, we're going to reference back to this episode quite a bit. Check out our webinar on January 10th. And uh, here we go in the new year. We'll see you next week. Hooray, yep. democracy. Hooray, democracy.